Welcome to this lecture covering chapter 8 of our text. Uh, the title of this chapter is The Proper Form of the Contract, The Writing. Um, let me get started, even this is the second lecture, let me just do a very brief a recap of what we covered in the first lecture. In the first lecture, we discussed the statute of frauds. That's our first item on our three item to-do list for this chapter. Uh, today, we'll be focusing on the interpretation rules for contracts and the parole evidence rule. No worries though, these two should go faster than to, even, in, even though we're covering two topics than the single topic of statute of frauds all by itself. And again, whenever we think about statute of frauds, a good way of thinking about it is the my legs term. Um, I'm just gonna flip over here for a second so you can see the my legs. This is the way that um, uh, many times people think about um, the statute of frauds. Here we go, let me go scroll down here to number eight. And here we have the mnemonic device, my legs. M for marriage, Y for year, L for land, E for executor, G for goods over $500, and S for surety or guarantor, the person who is co-signing for the loan. Um, so we covered those, uh, my legs, and we went through these topics. We even discussed um, what type of writing satisfies the statute of frauds. And now we're ready for our two topics that we'll be covering today. The first is interpretation rules for contracts. Now these rules apply to contracts, whether or written contracts, whether or not the contracts had to be in writing in the first place. As we discussed, most writings don't have to be written, but um, it's smart to memorialize your agreement in written form. Let's assume you choose to do so. You have reduced your agreement to written form. Um, these rules that we're about to talk about are going to aid the court in de deciding how to interpret that language. So even if the contract didn't have to be in writing, we'll use these terms but we'll, or these rules, but we'll also use these rules in the case of a contract that had to be in writing. So we're not just focusing upon statute of fraud situations in, these, in this particular instance. So let's get started. Here are, I guess, seven rules, and this is not an exhaustive list of all the contract interpretation rules out there, um, but this is a good starting point. One of the first things that we want to do when we look at a contract is not focus on one small little bit to the exclusion of the, um, the whole uh, topic. For example, if the only thing you felt um, was the tail of an elephant, you might think that the, ele uh, that the animal that you were dealing with was very small because the tail of an elephant isn't very long, it isn't very thick, it isn't very big. Um, but that's not the way that we look at an elephant, we look at the whole body. We look at you know, the tusks and the trunk and the ears and the whole body, and then we get a much different sense as to the size of the animal. And that's how we're gonna look at contracts. There may be a provision that if read in isolation would suggest meaning X, but when you read it in the totality, you realize that no, the writers didn't mean X, they meant Y. And that's how you ought to approach uh, a contract, is looking at it as a whole. Let me just put up here an example of a contract. This is just one of, of many that we could look at. And we can see here, it's a pretty standard short little contract. This is how contracts typically look. Um, we have here, um, the name of the contract, we would sample agreement, obviously that wouldn't be the name you'd come up with actually. We can see that in this first little section, we typically have the date that the parties entered into the contract. Sometimes the date isn't here, sometimes it's going to be at the end. Either place is fine. Then you're going to say who is in the contract. And you typically write the names and you oftentimes define who the people are in the contract. Um, so you might say, um, you know, the, let's say the name of the company is ABC Corporation. Well, you might just abbreviate it to ABC or John Q. Smith. You might just say Smith here. Typically, when you define a term, 
you're going to put it in parentheses and then in quotes, and then you're going to capitalize all but really small words like the and and. And so whenever you see the word committee in the rest of this document, let's just do a search here and find all the times that we have the word committee. Ah, uh, here. This term means the same as as however we we uh, we defined it above here. This term doesn't refer to just any old committee. It has to refer to this defined term. And you can see it's actually used 23 times. So let's say that the name was very long, the committee for blah, 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 blah. It gets to be a hassle to write out that whole name time and time again. So this can be a nice type of shorthand. And then we have various clauses. You can see each one of these paragraphs is going to be numbered. This makes it easy so that when the parties are trying to implement it, the parties can say, well, you know, paragraph six provides X, Y, and Z, and people don't have to go, well, let's count one, two, three, four, five, six. No, they're already pre-numbered. And then you can see they're not just numbered, but they typically have a name. And this is a very common structure. You don't have to do it this way, but this is uh, the, the most common way, certainly the way I've seen the majority of the contracts I've dealt with. Um, you'll have a very brief title. It'll be on the same line, so you typically don't uh, move the body below it, but you'll have the, the title here, and usually it's underlined with a period at the end. And this gives the reader an understanding about what the topic of this particular uh, a paragraph is about. And you can see, let's look at paragraph five. It's about confidentiality. Well, so you, now you know what the topic is. And this, this whole paragraph is going to touch on the topic of confidentiality. And this makes it quick so that if somebody's like, well, well what are the, what's the termination procedure for this contract? Oh, wait a second, down here in number seven, we talk about that. You can see that none of the, the paragraphs are super long. The longest one is probably this one. And so uh, that's a pretty common thing. You will sometimes see paragraphs longer than this. I certainly don't want to say that there aren't. But you usually try to break down your topics into kind of bite-sized pieces. It's because if you have a paragraph that goes on for three or four pages, well, you can see how you're asking, when you refer to that paragraph, you're asking somebody to read a lot of, of material. And uh, reading contracts is pretty dense, hard work. And so usually you don't want to do that if you can avoid it. And you can see at the end, <clears throat> we have a closing saying, hey, we're executing this, and you have the name. And typically below the name, you'll include a person's title. Let's say John Q. Smith signs this. What you'd want to know is John Q. Smith signing in on his own behalf or on the behalf of his company. Let's say he's the CEO of Smith Industries Incorporated. Well, you'd want to show John Q. Smith and then a chief executive offer Smith Industries Incorporated. But maybe John Q. Smith is signing in his own capacity. <clears throat> so then it would be John Q. Smith, comma, individually, perhaps. So this is an example, and you can see very commonly you'll have a schedule with some additional information about dates and times and scopes of various tasks. So this is a very short but a very typical agreement that you might see. Let's go back to our PowerPoint. So we want to examine the contract as a whole. We also want to examine the circumstances surrounding the contract. <clears throat> if you know what was happening that led to the parties entering into this contract that was going on in the businesses, sometimes that can help you make sense out of why the people entered into this contract, what, they, what they were trying to accomplish, and what the terms are that they were planning on developing. It can also be useful to understand the circumstances to decide whether there's something like undue influence or um, duress or fraud or something along those lines. One of those topics we covered that would destroy mutuality of assent. Related to this item is this item to determine the primary purpose of the parties in entering into this contract. You can see how the circumstances are going to give you insights as to the purpose. So let's go, let's look at number two and number four. And, and the part that might be most especially useful in a contract to establish is other than, of course, going outside the four corners of the document, 
would be to look at the recitals. Not all contracts have recitals. For example, the contract I was just showing you doesn't include recitals. Um, but what is a recital? Well, I'm not talking about, you know, a ballet recital <laughs> or anything like that. Uh, we're talking about recitals as in I'm reciting something, I'm repeating something, um, I am citing something again is of course where we have this term here. And here's an example of what a recital might look like. Hastings sub one, that must be a defined term, so this is one of the parties to the contract most likely, is a wholly owned subsidiary of Hastings. Again, probably this is a defined term. Hastings sub one owns and operates, collects and collection and hauling operations, transfer stations, landfills, and recycling facilities in the state of New York. That business, the business. So this is a defined term. Mr. Hastings is Chief Executive Officer of Hastings and Hastings Sub 1. So this is giving you some sense as to the organization of this entity. And again, that's covering some of the circumstances surrounding the contract. Let's go back. JARO, the Hastings parties, again, this is most likely a defined term. Hastings Newton Inc., a New York corporation, a wholly owned subsidiary of Hastings. So now we have this. All of this is being defined as Hastings Sub 2. And Raven Fund Limited, a Bahamas corporation, all of this is being defined as Raven. Our party to a letter of intent signed on this date concerning sale of JARO and of assets of Hastings Sub and Hastings Sub 2, letter of intent. So all of this is defined as the letter of intent. So you can see it's giving you kind of what, where people were organizationally, what they were trying to accomplish. It tells the story of how we got there. Once you tell this whole story, then the parties start with the actual agreement. These are the actual terms. These aren't actionable. This is really like almost like a novel. Yeah, I mean, it's true, but I guess a nonfiction book. It's telling you kind of bit by bit what happened here, what happened there, what happened next, and it's, it's to tell a story. Now, if the actual agreement doesn't fit with the recitals, in most cases, the courts are going to enforce the actual agreement. agreement. Um, but this can help clarify, let's say there's something in the actual agreement that is ambiguous. You, well, then the court might well refer to the recitals to get clarity about exactly what the parties were thinking about. So this helps, again, the court decide um, uh, the circumstances and also what the parties were trying to accomplish. Another thing that's important is um, how you're going to construe, construe terms. This goes back to the idea of kind of a tiebreaker. Um, usually, uh, or oftentimes, I want to say usually, sometimes you will have a single party draft the agreement. For example, let's go back to our model here. If we were to use this, somebody located this agreement, and my guess is that um, it's something that either, uh, uh, it's either prepared that kind of is to the advantage of um, the committee or to the advantage of the contractor. So let's say that it tends to be to the benefit of the contractor. And you've, dra you've drafted this, you usually represent contractors, and this is kind of your boilerplate that you do. Well, you can see um, that you would probably draft it in a way that is going to be um, kind of favoring your side, so to speak. You know, I mean, I'm not saying it's unfair or secretive or anything like that, but um, you know, there's ways of writing things that kind of gives one side a little bit of an advantage over the other. Um, when you have that, you, um, uh, you know, it kind of makes sense that, that the drafter would be the person in that position to kind of make it an advantageous situation. So the courts have a way of kind of equalizing it. The way the courts do that is by saying, listen, when there's a tie, when we really don't know what the parties intended and we have some ambiguity, we're going to construe it against the drafter. And uh, the reason for that is, well, the drafter is the one who chose the words. If he or she wanted to be more precise, he or she had the opportunity to be more precise. And so we're going to assume if there's a real tie, tie goes to the person who didn't draft. That's the rule, and there's a logic to the rule for sure, but there's also kind of an unfairness about it because keep in mind the person who's drafted it has typically been the one who's worked hardest on the contract. I mean, it takes time. Some contracts can 
be hundreds of hours just to draft it. And so you have somebody who's probably hired an attorney or maybe they've drafted on their own, but still it's involved a lot of hours. They're the ones who are working hard. The other guy is in some sense kind of letting the other side do all the hard work. And yet even though you spent all this time working hard, it's now to your disadvantage. The lazy guy is getting the benefit of the doubt. As a result, typically when you see one side um, having most of the drafting responsibility, and if that side is, is savvy, that side will oftentimes say, listen, other guy, you need to draft a portion of the agreement. And the reason that the drafting side wants to have the other side draft a portion is so that both sides can honestly say, hey, we're both drafters, so it shouldn't be construed against either one of us. And that way, it's a way to avoid that unpleasant effect. Also, there's sometimes a provision in a contract that will say uh, both sides participate in the drafting of this contract and therefore it should not be interpreted or construed against either side. So that's an important thing to think about when you're drafting it. Consider, even if you're the main side of this drafting, consider giving the other side at least some language to, to draft the first drafting on. Now keep in mind, um, if, it's, if they're too sophisticated parties, there's going to be a back and forth. People are like, oh, well, I would prefer this language. Well, I would prefer this language. And so you probably are going to end up with something that's kind of halfway between where the parties are. We've already discussed the primary purpose idea. Let me just check these off. We've talked about this one. 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 Now we have the issue of give common words their plain meanings. Um, let's talk a little bit about that. I'll put a word up here. You probably are familiar with this word if you speak English. This is a very common word. Before we go any farther, I want you to jot down on a piece of paper, or at least mentally jot down on a piece of paper, um, a very brief, less than, say, five-word definition of this term. I mean, it's a word you use probably every day, so it shouldn't be hard for you to come up with a really short definition. I'll give you just a second to do that. Um, I'm going to suggest some definitions that people might have come up with. One might be a youth or an infant or a baby or a young person, um, maybe a student, someone under the age of 18. These are very common definitions for a child, and they're good ones. Uh, I think we can all relate to them. Um, and we probably would have all thought to ourselves, well, child, I mean, it's a pretty obvious word. It's not ambiguous. It doesn't, you know, I mean, there are some words in English that have more than one meaning. For example, um, if I were to have put this word up here, oops, <laughs> um, this can mean minute, you know, 60 seconds, or it can mean minute very small. Those are two different meanings associated with that term. Um, and so this is inherently uh, ambiguous. But most of us would say, I mean, child isn't ambiguous. This is what it means. I mean, yeah, there's a big difference between a baby and a teenager. I, I would agree with that. But um, they, they all fit into that larger umbrella of child. And so let's say that we had this con contractual language. Um, uh, let's see, Smith agrees to um, uh, pay to Larry Smith child, oops, child of Bob. Smith, $100 a month. Okay, so we have the term child here. Let's assume as a background fact, maybe this was in the recitals, maybe we just know this. Larry Smith is 16 years old and 16 years old. 
and two months old, okay? So now we're trying to decide when does Smith's obligation to Larry Smith end? Well, if it ends when Larry Smith stops being someone under the age of 18, in other words, he stops being a child, then we would say that he's got, let's see, 16, 3, 16, 4, 16, 5, 16, 6, 16, 7, 16, 8, 16, 9, 16, 10, 16, 11, 16, 12. That's 10 payments um, while 16 and 12 payments while 17. So we have a total of 22 payments. This is assuming that he's exactly um, this. Well, actually, he's, he's at least one day older than this, so he's not going to get it for this first month. So I suppose it could be that this is supposed to be 11. A um, little bit of ambiguity there since we don't know enough of the specifics. But it, it looks like about 22 payments is what we're going to be looking at. That's one way of reading this, and I'm not saying that's a wrong way of reading it, but another way of reading it is, well, when Larry Smith is 18 years old, has he ceased to be the child of Bob Smith? And in fact, when Larry Smith is um, 28 years old, has he ceased to be the child of Bob Smith? Well, no, he will always be the child of Bob Smith. When Larry Smith is 99 years old and Bob Smith, his dad, has been dead for, you know, 70 years, Larry Smith is still the child of Bob because child has another meaning in English the offspring of the parent, right? Even if the offspring is an adult. So this is an ambiguous uh, provision because we don't know whether they meant that the payment should end when Larry Smith ceases to be a youth or if it's intended to go on forever and that Larry, the, that Smith is always, let's not make this Smith, let's make this Jones here. Jones is supposed to pay Larry Smith for the rest of Larry Smith's life. Um, and that this is, this uh, child of Bob Smith is de designed to define which Larry Smith we're talking about, not when the obligation is going to end. Both interpretations are reasonable. Let's see. So this is one way. Let's let's do another way. Let's say Larry Smith is 16 years and two months old and dies when he is 26 years and two months old. So he lives a total of 10 years, which would be times 12 months, so he would get 120 payments instead of 22 payments. This is a pretty significant deal for Jones. Is Jones signing up for 22 or 120? And of course, if this is uh, what Jones meant to sign up for, in a way he's lucky <laughs> that Larry died as, as young as he did. This could have been, you know, a thousand or more. And so um, as a result, you can see how figuring out what a word like child means is pretty important to a contract. So you shouldn't think that it's the, uh, the unusual word that is ambiguous or the long or technical word that is ambiguous. Certainly those can be ambiguous, but those are actually less likely to be ambiguous than your everyday words because we, we, we use them all the time that we've added lots of different shades of meaning to them in ways that less frequently used words aren't, aren't going to have as many shades of meaning. Okay, so um, we do want to give common words, they're plain meanings, but we ought to be aware of the fact that plain meanings can be fraught with challenges. And a good strategy is to look at those challenging words and say, wait a second, does it have any other meaning? Is there a second way of reading this? Let's also consider the issue of technical words. We want to give technical words or technical meanings. And this is being put in, in contrast to the word common. So I mean, it's common is a word that everybody kind of understands. If you're an adult, you're going to know that, and you're a native English speaker, not even a native, but you are a fluent English speaker, 
You're an adult, you're a fluent English speaker, you're going to know this word, you're going to know what people mean when they say this word. Technical words, though, may be words that aren't part of your vocabulary, or even if they are part of your vocabulary, you may either not have a precise meaning associated with them, or you might have a different meaning than is commonly uh, used in the maybe the larger community. So let's look at an example of that. Um, here we go. Um, let's see here. Let's go ahead and look at definitions first, then we'll look at, at um, technical terms. Here are some defined terms, again, in just an example agreement. Um, here, just looking at some of the things we've already looked at, see we have a title, and we have that initial provision. You can see that they have defined their franchise renewal agreement as the agreement or the franchise. And you can see it's between the City of Davis, which they're calling City, and Comcast of California X. Incorporated, which they're calling the grantee. This looks probably like a recital right here. Okay, they didn't actually number it. And you can see in this situation, uh, they didn't use the one, two, three. They had section one, so they numbered it 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. That's also a pretty common way of doing it. And you can see the first section they have here is some definitions. Again, it wouldn't have been unusual to have a second, uh, to call this the first section with the recitals or introductory materials. The definition section can be at the beginning of a contract or it can be at the end. Um, if you just have a few defined terms, you're probably not going to have a separate section for it. You can see here, even in this agreement, even though they have a defined section, they have some defined terms that they aren't defining in the section, they're defining in the body before they get to the definition section. Uh, but those are more matters of convenience than really technical definitions. And you can see here, though, they have technical definitions. Let's just look at this first one so we can get a flavor for it. Access means the availability for non-commercial use of various agencies, institutions, organizations, groups, and individuals in the community, including the city and its de de uh, designees of the cable system to acquire, create, uh, receive, and distribute uh, video cable services and other services and signals as permitted under applicable law. The term includes, but is not limited to government access as that term is defined below. And you can see the terms are capitalized, so you'd want to flip to that a definition section. Usually the definitions are going to be in alphabetical order, so you can see we're starting with our A's here. There are a couple of interesting things that I saw, and one is that they do not have an Oxford comma here, right? And yet they clearly want to have an Oxford comma here, or they're, they're seeing this as a list of one, two, three, four, five items because they only have one and, and it's right here. Um, so that's a, a little sloppiness with the writing, but we can see down here they do use the Oxford comma. Acquire comma, create comma, receive comma, and distribute. Not good. Um, it's best to use the Oxford comma virtually all the time unless it somehow would create confusion, which is possible, but very rare. Um, but if you, um, if you if you decided for whatever reason not to use the Oxford comma, boy, you really never should use the Oxford comma because you've opened yourself up to some ambiguity there. So not a good practice. But here is an other than that problem. Here's a good example of a definition, and it's very likely that Comcast of California has some standard language. They're not going to reinvent the wheel every time they negotiate this contract. They always have this access issue. I'm sure they always have this active electronics issue and affiliate, and so they're going to pull these out, plot them into the agreement. Now, the city of Davis may tweak some of this. Well, we don't want to have this part in. We don't want to have that part in. There may be a give and take, but you, it's best to start with something uh, to work with. So these are some examples of defined terms and you can see this is a way to get rid of of ambiguity or imprecision the word access we might think of generally as well gosh everybody knows what access means but uh, you can see how it's important probably to be more specific about exactly what we mean for this term in this context um, so let's let's talk about some technical terms and it quite might well be the case that these are some technical terms but let's look at another example um, of things relating to technical terms the following is an example of a specification containing a technical term that was given its technical meaning 
Um, a dispute arose between a contractor and a subcontractor as to mean the technical term number four finish with regard to smoothness of welds. So this is a welding operation and we're trying to figure out well how um, smooth does the point have to be where the welder has connected two pieces of metal together. The subcontract, subcontract required the subcontract to subcontractor to polish welds. The specification read, polishing of the welds is a part of this contract. All services welded to be finished to a number four finish with a maximum roughness finished tolerance allowable of 42 micro inches. The contractor testified that the technical meaning of the term number four finish meant polished to a smoothness that did not exceed 42 micro inches resulting in a surface without pits. Also, an independent expert verified this technical definition. The court held that the subcontractor incorrectly interpreted the requirement he should not be allowed to polish the weld less than required by the contractor's definition. The court stated, the parties use terms which have a definite meaning in the industry and may not now be heard to say they did not use the terms as the industry in, in, um, understood them. Now this one, it appears that really both the word and its meaning is in the agreement. But let's say that in this particular contract, the two parties had ended it with number four finish period. That might be even a better example of the technical meaning. I mean, unless you're a welder, my guess is you're as, as lost with these terms as I was. I don't know what number, I still don't really know what 40, 42 micro inches means, but I certainly wouldn't know what number four finish means. You know, it doesn't always make sense to define these terms uh, when everybody in the industry knows. It's a little bit like when we're writing a contract, we don't define the word, you know, the, or we don't define the word contract in a contract. I mean, if you have to define everything, your contract is going to be so, so long. And so you, you want to restrict your contracts to the things that need to be defined. You certainly want to do those, but you don't probably want to go overboard to the other extreme, especially when a term has a very clear and precise meaning. So we're not, so when we see number four finish, we're not going to say, well, gosh, I know what the word four means. I know what the word number means. I know what the word finish means. No, but I mean, I know what each one of those words individually means in common English, but I don't know what they meant because they had a technical meaning associated with that. And the courts will look to people in that industry to get that technical meaning. Okay, and let's consider also let negotiated provisions control over standardized ones. Here, let's, um, I have some arbitration clauses in here. These are oftentimes what are called boilerplate. When you hear the term boilerplate, um, these are terms that people use, or excuse me, clauses people use again and again. Again, you will, you will discover in your career that you will often uh, cannibalize contracts that you've used in the past or that you are borrowing from other people. Take a clause from here, take a clause from there. Uh, use uh, some, some uh, contract bank to get everything that you need and then bring them together. Yes, you're going to have to tweak them. Uh, some of the language isn't going to fit exactly right. You you're, you're won't flow very well if they're all written different styles. But it's a good starting point. It's going to save you a tremendous amount of time. And you'll end up with a better product because these models, people will have thought and thought and fussed and fretted about it for a long period of time. They will have considered the words carefully. If you're drafting from scratch, that's, a, that's really, really hard because you have to sweat over every word, every comma. Think very, very carefully about it. But if you're given something from a good source that was written carefully, um, you can just tweak it and it can go a lot faster. So you want to, um, to, to use those resources. But when you are working with boilerplate like these, you, um, 
are probably not going to negotiate too much over. Let's say both you and the other side has agreed to arbitration. So you might say, okay, I'll just stick in our standard arbitration clause. And maybe it's this one right here, arbitration. All claims and disputes arising under or related to this agreement, and then you obviously have to change the name if you've defined your agreement with a different name, are to be settled by binding arbitration in the state of, we'll say Texas, or another location mutually agreeable to the parties. An award of arbitration may be confirmed in a court of competent jurisdiction. So that's some boilerplate. If the parties never really talk about that again, they don't tweak the language, um, but there's another provision in the contract in which there has been a lively debate about how arbitration is going to work. So we have a negotiated section about arbitration, then we have another section that we never really talked about. Well, the courts are going to give more weight to that negotiated section because that really reflects more what the parties were thinking because there was a give and take, a compromise situation. That's just kind of common sense. Now you may think to yourself, why would you have a negotiated provision over something and then a standardized provision? You can have contracts that are hundreds of pages long and somebody may have just forgotten to cut that paragraph out. You might have initially had the standardized one and there was active negotiation and maybe people moved that provision from this area to this area. Or maybe the negotiated provision really was isn't primarily about the arbitration, it just kind of touches on it a little bit. And so um, it may, might uh, not be focused on, on the arbitration more specifically, but since the particular issue that you're confronting, um, that section is also relevant to it, the courts might well conclude that that's the section that controls over the standardized ones. A little profoundness here. How strangely will the tools of a tyrant pervert the plain meanings of words? Um, a little bit of, I think Samuel Adams made beer. He wasn't an attorney, but it sounds like he might have had some wisdom there. Okay, so let's talk about the strict construction doctrine. Uh, there's a couple of, of, another term for this is um, the Four Corners Doctrine. And this is the idea, it's not referring to the four states that meet together in the Four Corners, um, at least not in this context. It's referring to the four corners of a page. You know, a piece of paper here has four corners. One corner's right here, one corner's right here, one corner's right here, one corner's right here. And the point is, if it's not on what, within the four corners of the document, it's like it never happened. Um, we're only going to look at what's written down on paper. Um, obviously, your contract might be longer than one page, so it could be instead of four corners, it could be eight corners or 16 corners or 400 corners for that matter. But once you get all those papers set up, it's going to be somewhere in there if you're going to rely upon it. So the strict construction doctrine is a supportive of the parole evidence rule, um, which we will talk about in more detail. Um, so the four corners is the, the face of the document or instrument. It relates to the act of construing a document based upon the document alone without recourse to extrinsic, which means outside evidence. Going back here, we talked about investigating the circumstances and we talked about the primary purpose of the parties. Um, but we also look to the contract itself to tell us about that. That doesn't mean that you can never look outside of the actual contract for that information, but it does mean that there's a kind of a presumption, especially when the contract uh, purports to be or appears to be uh, complete about what the actual parties are talking about. We've also talked a little about plain meaning, but let's reflect upon that a little bit longer. And this is that quote from Sam Adams. How strangely will the tools of a tyrant pervert this plain meaning of words? We talked about the example of the word child. The plain meaning rule means that interpreting a contract whose wording is unambiguous, the courts will follow the generally accepted meaning of the words used. This to me, I'm going to be honest with you, is a bit of a, of a fake issue. Because obviously, if it's unambiguous, we all know that the courts are going to interpret it as is supposed to be interpreted because it's unambiguous. So the issue re really is, well, is it unambiguous or not? If it's unambiguous, then the plain meaning rule applies, but if it's ambiguous, the plain meaning rule doesn't apply. So really, the, the, where, where, where it gets interesting is whether it is inherently ambiguous or not. 
Um, so uh, th this rule has always seemed a little nonsensical to me. We already discussed the negotiated terms, supersized boilerplate terms. Um, and then we have the idea of custom. And this is what we were talking about a little bit when we were discussing that four inch um, provision. And we can see that they actually talked about the custom. An expert, an independent expert, verified this technical definition. This is the customary definition that is used under these circumstances. And so custom is important to figuring out how to interpret terms within a contract. Let's consider types of custom. We have kind of an, a funnel here. So let's look at the red level of the, uh, so we're going to say this, this level right here. This is the broadest category and the most, um, uh, the, the, the least important really. And it's, it's a little bit like this Easter egg hunt. You know, a, a custom in, in your community might be to have a community-wide Easter egg hunt. But that doesn't mean everybody's there. It doesn't mean that everybody participates in Easter egg hunts or, or identifies that as an activity they would want to participate in. Uh, it, it's generally done, but it doesn't mean that everyone in that community gets involved in it. So if you don't have any other information and yet people in this particular industry tends to do that, for example, going back to um, our example, let's say that this is, you could, you could define this as an industry custom, the number four finish. That could be what, you know, 80% of people in this industry use. But if there's 80% who use it, then there's 20% who don't, right? And so uh, if all you have is the information that 80% do it, that's some piece of information. But isn't it even better if you get a little bit more specific? And you say, well, instead of what people in the industry use, why don't we consider what people, what, what the two parties to this contract do? And that is the course of dealings. So now we're not talking about the whole community. Maybe we're talking about a particular neighborhood in this larger city. Maybe this particular neighborhood um, always has an Easter bunny or one of the parents dresses up as an Easter bunny and, and goes and meets the, the kids as they are uh, looking at, at their Easter, they're dressed in their Easter uh, hats and dresses and suits and all that cool stuff. And so uh, that's more specific um, to the actual uh, people who are involved in this situation. So it's going to be more precise. It's going to be more accurate information. In the context of contracts, we're actually, let's say that it's uh, Smith and Jones are involved in this. We're actually talking about what has Smith and Jones done in previous contracts. I mean, it doesn't mean that in this new contract they didn't want to do something different, but if we have a history of them entering into uh, the same contract for several years in a row, and they've always had provision X, or they've always done provision X, even if it wasn't part of their formal agreement, it's always they, what they understood what they were going to do, well, probably they wanted to do provision X in this next agreement, unless there's language saying, oh, let's not do provision X anymore, okay? And so that, that's even more uh, persuasive reasoning, more specific reasoning. You can see the funnel's getting narrower. Of course, the most persuasive is going to be this particular contract. What did the parties intend to do and what have the parties done with respect to this particular contract? You might say with respect to the Easter egg race, what does a particular family do? It might be that a particular family doesn't even go to the neighborhood Easter egg hunt. Maybe the family isn't religious or maybe they are of a different religion. Or maybe they have their own customs. Maybe they do their Easter egg hunt in their backyard or maybe they um, don't do an Easter egg hunt. They uh, go and um, have... Um, Maybe they, they go and work at a food kitchen or something like that to, uh, to, uh, for, the, for the holiday purposes. And so again, this is even more specific than the course of dealing because this is about this particular contract. 
it's the most specific it's the narrowest part with the most accurate information so if the court has all three of these pieces but they all don't lead to the same meaning this is the one that's going to be given the most weight now many times of course all three of these pieces will be saying the same thing and then they all just reinforce each other but if one if this one doesn't gel with the bottom two then the court's likely to reject this one if these two aren't consistent with this the court's probably going to reject these two and stay with this but if they reinforce each other, that's just going to increase the, the weight of that evidence. Okay, so now we've talked about, again, in our first lecture, the statute of frauds, and now we've talked about the interpretation rules for contract. I briefly mentioned the parole evidence rule, but now we're really going to talk about it. The parole evidence rule is kind of a cool rule. The first thing to, uh, to share with you is that before we get into specifics, the parole evidence rule is a good thing you as a legal professional want it to apply to the contract that your client enters into. And you may say, okay, uh, well, what is the rule? But before we get into the rule, I just want to make it clear, we like this rule. Legal professionals like this rule. So let's go forward and talk about it. The parole evidence rule. This is um, from the textbook's glossary. I borrowed this. So it's not from the actual textbook chapter. So the parole evidence rule is a rule that written contracts may not be varied. When we say varied here, we mean altered. So think about the word altered. Contradicted or altered, I guess I should need to do that, by any prior or contemporaneous oral declarations. So imagine that um, Bob and Teresa are negotiating a contract. Um, Bob runs a lawn service that Teresa is considering hiring. And one of the features that Bob offers is that he will mow and um, edge the lawn um, uh, once a week and on the and every four weeks he will trim any shrubbery that's an additional service once you've had once you've had four lawn mows um, he will throw in the, the free pruning for that uh, fifth time that you're paying for the lawn service that that's a deal that Bob regularly offers his clients and in fact Teresa and Bob have talked about that a lot and Teresa said yeah that that sounds like a really nice deal I I really like that idea my my bushes do grow pretty much over the summer and I don't really like to trim them so I um, I would would enjoy having that that every every four or five weeks uh, plant trimming Bob goes okay great a um, few days pass, Bob stops by Teresa's house and says, hey, Teresa, here's the contract. As we discussed, it will be $25 a week for the lawn service. I will mow and edge your front and back yard. Teresa looks at the contract. Yeah, it says just that. Teresa signs, Bob signs, Bob goes about his business. Uh, the next week, Bob starts the lawn mow. He mows the lawn and he edges it. Teresa pays $25. Maybe she leaves him with a doormat. And this goes forward for the first four sessions. The fifth week, Bob mows and edges just like usual. Teresa has the $25 check underneath her doormat. The sixth week, Bob shows up and Teresa's waiting there and she looks kind of perturbed. Bob, last week you didn't prune my bushes. Um, you know, did you forget? Were you going to do it this week? What's the deal? And Bob goes, oh, well, uh, that's not a provision in our contract, so I won't be doing that. I mean, I'll do it for you if you pay me money, but that's not what our deal is. And Teresa says, but we talked about that. That was what we, that was one of the things you said that, that was going to happen. I said, well, you know, I, I threw that out there as a possibility. Certainly we talked about that as a possibility, but when we actually had the contract that wasn't in it. And so therefore I'm not going to do that service. So let's say Teresa sues Bob over in a small claims court. Well, Bob is going to have a pretty good argument because all of those conversations between Teresa and Bob happened prior to, 
to the signing of the written contract. Perhaps it happened around the same time, so you could argue maybe it's contemporaneous. But if Teresa really wanted that, that pruning to happen, she should have read the contract carefully and made sure that that was documented. She chose not to, and so therefore the court isn't going to allow her oral testimony. The idea is, hey, Teresa, if you want the bushes to be pruned, make sure it's in the contract before you sign on the dotted line. Um, if you don't care, then don't get mad and don't care enough to read it, then don't get mad when it's missing from the contract and you don't get those advantages that you had, had hoped you had contracted for. So that's the takeaway. That's why you want to make sure that you, you separate uh, the negotiation process from the actual writing of the contract. Um, the reason that we always want the parole evidence rule to be in effect is that there's going to be a lot of give and take in negotiation, especially over something significant. Lots of ideas are going to be thrown out and rejected and changed and tweaked and all that kind of stuff. And people are sometimes going to forget, oh, was that just a negotiating posture earlier? Or was that the final deal? And sometimes people forget, sometimes people don't they're not completely honest. And that's one of the reasons why we write this down, put ink to paper, so that we have a permanent record serving say, yes, this is the deal. This is what we decided. And they can look it over and they can tweak the language and they can, why'd you put it here? Why did you say this? I think we ought to do this. It gives you one last shot to get it right. Um, but if, if somehow or another, whatever you've spent that blood, sweat, and tears to write it down, if somebody can come back and say, well, yeah, I know I signed that document, but I really wanted this deal. So I, I, I think this is really what our deal is. Well, that defeated the whole purpose of having a writing. So we want the parole evidence rule to apply. One thing that's quirky about the parole evidence rule is, is this word parole. Um, in everyday conversation, we actually have a kind of a different meaning for that. That word has an E at the end of it. And we may have, if you've watched, you know, Perry Mason or Law and Order or something like that, you've probably heard about people being on parole. They've been released from prison. Again, this has nothing to do with um, incarceration or being released from uh, 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 prison. You can see in the word parole, if you remove the P and you rearrange the letters, you will see that you have the word oral. Here we have an A, an R, an O, and an L. That's kind of a good mnemonic for remembering parole. Having said that, technically the parole evidence rule is not restricted to oral statements. It could be something that had been in writing. Let's say instead of Bob and Teresa talking face to face, they had exchanged a series of email messages or text messages or facsimiles or even snail mail, right? And, and those were part of that negotiation process but weren't part of the final agreement. Well, guess what? All of those written documents that were not incorporated into the actual final agreement, they also are going to be excluded from evidence. Again, because of that strict construction doctrine, those four corners we talked about before. Let me just refresh you on that. Strict construction doctrine, a narrow or literal construction of the written material. Four corners, the face of a document or instrument relates to the act of construing a document based upon the document alone without recourse to extrinsic evidence. Again, this is that parole evidence rule. Um, and we want the parole evidence rule to apply, so they draft in such a way, they draft the contract in such a way that the court is more likely to apply the parole evidence rule. Um, that is your goal. And you can see in this little, um, <laughs> little blurb here, we have the judge and we have an attorney arguing, despite the integration clause, we'll talk about what that is in a second, I'd like to show the existence of a whole separate agreement. And the judge is saying, La, 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 la. I'm not listening. He has his hands in his ears. If there's an integration clause and it appears to be a complete contract, the judge doesn't want to hear parole evidence. He's not going to hear it. Now, I said before that contract drafters want the parole evidence rule to apply, but obviously whenever you have a dispute like this, one side wants the rule to apply and the other side doesn't. 
So this doesn't mean that in, you might have a client at some point who, gosh, really feels like the written agreement did not represent his actual negotiated agreement and he's trying to get out of it. Obviously in that situation, yeah, you don't want the parole evidence rule applied. But you don't know about that happening at the time that you're drafting the contract. So whenever you draft a contract, you work from the idea of, I want this contract to be tight. I want this contract to cover everything. And I want the parole evidence rule to apply. And again, if, if you had a crystal ball and you knew what the issues were going to be later on, then you would have addressed those issues at the time that you were drafting the contract. So let's talk about merger clauses. Again, this is one of those clauses in a contract. A lot of times this is boilerplate, stuff that you're not going to rewrite again and again. You're just going to take from one contract to the other. So a merger clause, we're not talking about merging into traffic. Um, it's a clause that states all prior oral or written agreements are merged into the existing document. In other words, all of the stuff that ended up being part of the deal that weren't rejected is in the present in the agreement. So if you have this type of clause, going back to Bob and Teresa's agreement, let's say Bob's agreement that Teresa signed had a merger clause, then or an integration clause, that's the same thing. This is a merger clause right here. Um, then that's going to make it even more difficult for Teresa to persuade the court to hear her story about the every five week pruning service that she feels like she was entitled to. So this merger clause is acting to support the court in, um, or acting to encourage the court to apply the parole evidence rule. And again, this clause is very common and it's good to include it in contracts. Um, it's not magic pixie dust though. If you have a contract that is sketchy, that doesn't really cover the, the real nitty gritties of the deal, uh, fl uh, slapping, a pro uh, me, slapping an integration or merger clause on it isn't going to persuade the court that this represents the complete deal. It just won't work. But if you've got a pretty darn complete agreement, putting a merger clause in there is just one more piece of evidence that the court has to consider. It's going to push the court a little bit closer to saying no parole evidence. So again, it's one of the pieces of evidence that's going to make it more likely that the court is going to exclude um, the extrinsic evidence. And then, of course, what the, you're going to want to use this merger integration clause in an integrated contract. What is an integrated contract? Many times people say a fully integrated contract because it's going to be in comparison to a partially integrated contract. So a fully integrated contract is a written contract that contains all of the terms and conditions of the party's agreement, and it cannot be modified by parole evidence. So you're merger clause is saying, hey, our agreement is fully integrated. Let's look at an example of a merger clause. Let's see, did we talk about this one? Let's go back and talk about this one. This is, um, Oh yeah, okay, so I'm sorry, I forgot about this one. I, I had pulled it up and then forgot to type it. Let's go back a little bit. And this is um, kind of relating to the uh, standardized versus, actually not so much that, where it's more having to do with a technical versus common and when there's ambiguity in the term. So there's another example of that. So here, this is the contract language that we're gonna work with here. No, a scope of work. All work which is manifestly necessary to kiss will probably, here we go. Here we have a few technical difficulties there. Um, Will, will fall within the scope of work clause. And you can see customarily perform. That's our scope. And so you have to know, well, well what, do, what do people do? I mean, you could imagine that that industry could have a different custom. They could say, well, whenever you, um, uh, whenever a cabinet abuts a finished wall and that wall is removed, then the customer has to pay additional money 
for that specific service of finishing it. I mean, that could be the rule, It'd be just as good a rule, I guess, as, as the rule that we have. So um, in that system, you can see how an industry just says, well, this is what we're going to do. We could have gone with rule A, we could have gone with rule B, we went with rule A. Everybody knows the rule. So unless the contract clearly specifies the opposite of the industry rule, we're going to assume that everybody's playing by the same rule book, so to speak. It just makes life easier. So that's an example of where you can have ambiguity and we get um, an answer by looking at industry customs. So anyway, I'm sorry about taking that out of order a little bit. I wanted to make sure I've covered all my topics. Let's look at a merger clause now. Okay, so here we have um, Here's an example of a merger and integration clause. This agreement and the exhibits attached here to contain the entire agreement of the parties with respect to the subject matter of this agreement. So they're saying it's integrated agreement. That's what they're saying. It's the entire thing. And supersede all prior negotiations agreements. Can you want to put a comma here, the Oxford comma, and understandings with respect thereto. This agreement may only be amended by a written document duly executed by all parties. So this is an example of a merger clause. Let's look back to our first contract because it also included a merger clause. Here it's called uh, 12. Entire understanding. This document and any exhibit attached constitute the entire understanding and agreement of the parties and any and all prior agreements, understandings, and representations. See they use the Oxford comma here are hereby terminated and canceled in their entirety and of, of no other, no further force and effect. So that's an example of these types of clauses that you want to have in your contracts. So going back to our integrated contracts again, integrated contracts is final and complete. It says everything about the agreement. So the court is going to apply the parole evidence rule. The drafter of a contract is to create an integrated contract, and this is your goal if you're going to write it down whether the statute of frauds applies or not. Now, does a contract have to be an integrated contract to satisfy the statute of frauds if the statute of frauds applies? Probably not. Something less than an integrated contract is probably going to satisfy the statute of frauds, statute of frauds requirement when that statute of frauds requires a writing of some point. But again, you want to shoot for an integrated contract whenever you write one. Now let me pause and say that if you're doing a very small uh, negotiation over a very small service or, or good, are you going to want to spend dozens of hours over something that's a very small transaction? Probably not. So I don't mean to say every single contract you ever in want to enter into is always going to be fully integrated, but things that are important, you definitely do want to get it as integrated as you possibly can. So let's contrast an integrated contract with a partially integrated contract, which means basically some of the deal is not obvious. Some of the deal is not included in the written document. So a partially integrated contract is final. I mean, it's a real contract. It's not just negotiations. It's the real thing. But the actual written document is incomplete. In that situation, the, the parole evidence rule isn't going to apply. Um, there's going to be, the court is going to allow oral testimony about the missing stuff. So let's say in the contract that um, I'm going to, that um, I'm going to sell my car to Bob, but let's say I own two cars. I ha we haven't specified in our partially integrated contract which one I'm selling. And now we're, we have a dispute. Bob thinks that I am uh, selling him the Ferrari and I think that I'm selling him my Pinto. Well, under those circumstances, you can see it's a pretty big deal. So you'd want to, you'd have to allow parole evidence in to determine which one it is. But let's say my contract, our partially integrated contract, which is missing a lot of important stuff, but it does specify it's my Pinto. And maybe it doesn't say the year or the color or the VIN number or even what particular type of, let's say there are a variety of Pintos, what, which particular model of Pinto it is. But it definitely excludes Ferraris because a Ferrari isn't a Pinto and a Pinto isn't a Ferrari. And so in that situation, even though it's a partially integrated contract, the court isn't going to allow Bob to come in and say, well, 
when we wrote Pinto, we must have meant Ferrari. The new terms that are added can't contradict what's already in there. It either needs to add more detail, more specifics that are consistent with the document, or talk about something that we hadn't even broached within that, uh, that document. Obviously, the contract drafter has in some sense failed. <laughs> you don't want to be in the world of the partially integrated contract um, unless maybe you're just trying to save yourself from, from having a failed contract because of the statute of frauds. But this isn't a happy place to be. This isn't a goal. You always want to end up here, not here. Okay, so let's talk about some exceptions to the Pearl Evans rule. We've already kind of touched on a few of these, but we're going to focus on four. So the court is going to allow oral evidence in to clarify, supplement, or explain terms, but not to alter terms. Imagine that I happen to have two cars. One car is a lime green, we'll say I have a lime green um, uh, Subaru Forester. And then I also have a forest green Subaru Forester. In our contract, we just talk about a green forester. Well, lime green is a shade of green, forest green is a shade of green. And so if we allow oral testimony in, uh, saying that we completely negotiated just about the lime green, then we're clarifying a term that's in the contract. But let's say I happen to have a third car. This is also a Subaru Forester, but this one is fuchsia, it's bright pink. Well, there's no way that you, you could call a fuchsia car a shade of a green car. Pink isn't a type of green. So that would alter the terms of the agreement, not clarify, supplement, or explain. Again, this is the situation that we were just talking about when we have a partially integrated contract, like what we talked about over here. So another thing might be to resolve an ambiguity in the contractual language. For example, the use of the word child we talked about before. When we were talking about, um, let's see if I still have that up here. Yeah, we're talking about this is our contractual language. If, um, We'll say this is Mary Jones. If when Mary and let's say Bob, Bob and Mary were negotiating this agreement, um, one or both could present testimony about what they meant when they said that Mary was going to pay Larry a hundred dollars a month. Um, and Bob might say, well, this was, I, we were just using child to define which Larry we were talking about. There's lots of Larry Smiths in our community. Uh, there's Larry Smith, who's the child of, Harold Smith, and there's Larry Smith, who's the child of um, George Smith. And so we just provided child of Bob Smith so that everybody knew which Larry Smith we were talking about. And so that might be the backstory. And you can see that that is explaining why this language was included. So it's clarifying the ambiguity. And that is uh, likely to be allowed to clarify ambiguity. To show that a condition precedent to a contract has not been met. Obviously, a condition precedent turns on an obligation. Let's refresh the definition of condition precedent. A condition precedent or a preceding condition, because this is the noun and this is the adjective. So if we flip the order and we say a condition preceding, a, condition, a preceding condition or a condition that comes before a contractual obligation. That's a condition that must first occur for a contractual obligation to attach. The classic example is, um, I'm trying to buy Bob's house. Um, we've agreed on a contract price of $200,000. Uh, but I say to Bob, listen, Bob, I want to buy your house. I think I can buy your house. But to be honest with you, I haven't secured financing yet, and I can't afford to pay cash. So if I can't secure financing, I can't buy it. Uh, but I'm going to try my hardest to get financing, and I think I'll be able to. And Bob says, that's fine. I understand if you can't get financing, you know, the deal can't go through. Well, my securing a financing would be a condition precedent. The second I secure the financing, my obligations under the contract start. But if I'm not ever able to secure financing, if my condition precedent never happens, I don't have to buy the house. So this is, this is an 
uh, so this is a, it, it switches on, like a light switch switches, light switch on. Contractual light switch. Contract light switch on. So you can see how the wording of the contract won't tell you whether the condition precedent happened or not because of the time of the contract. We didn't know one way or the other. So let me show you an example of condition precedent type language. Um, here's an example of language that you might use in a condition precedent situation. Buyer's obligation to purchase the assets and to take other actions required to be taken by buyer at the closing is subject to the satisfaction at or prior to the closing of each of the following conditions. And then you would list what those conditions are. So again, this is setting it up for a condition precedent. Uh, maybe that the property has passed an inspection or maybe that certain problems with the property have been uh, resolved. Uh, for example, let's say there was a problem with um, some electrical wiring in the place, or maybe there was a, a leaky faucet or something along those lines. So um, those are the types of condition precedents that you might have. That um, again, the condition precedent ideally will be in the contract, and it will be if it's a fully integrated contract, but whether the condition precedent has actually happened or not, that's gonna require ex um, extraneous uh, testimony, additional testimony outside the four corners of the document. And then finally, to show the contract is some kind of formation defect. And here we're looking at uh, primarily those uh, mutuality of assent issues. We talked about six, fraud, misrepresentation, mistake, undue influence, duress, um, and uh, unconscionability could be another one of these. Another thing could be some kind of illegality, a violation of public policy, failure of consideration, something along those lines. Again, if it's a duress situation, there's nothing gonna, in the four corners of the document that's gonna talk about duress. I mean, if, if, if Bob held a gun to Teresa's head to get her to sign the contract, maybe I X that, X that out, but let's imagine we, we go back to the scenario where Bob has a lawn service, he persuades or he negotiates with Teresa to uh, pay Bob $25 if Bob mows the lawn. Uh, but Teresa changes her mind. Then Bob gets out a gun and says, Teresa, you sign this or I'm killing you. Teresa is, of course, going to sign it, right? But there's nothing in the contract that's going to say, Teresa's not going to say, I only sign this because Bob had a gun to my head because, after all, got, Bob's right there with the gun. There wouldn't be any reason for her to sign that because... Uh, Bob's going to, you know, kill her <laughs> if she says that. So uh, many of the t uh, mutuality of assent problems aren't going to show up here. If there's a fraud, if somehow or another Bob is lying to Teresa, he's not going to document his fraud in the agreement. He's not going to say, I am defrauding Teresa in the actual wording of the agreement, because if he did, Teresa wouldn't sign the agreement. So those types of problems aren't going to show up actually in the contract. So these are exceptions um, to the statute, of, I'm sorry, to the parole evidence rule. So let's look at the parole evidence rule here. The first thing we need to consider when we're thinking about the parole evidence rule is do we have a partially integrated contract or a fully integrated contract? If it's partially integrated, parole evidence is going to be allowed. Of course, the parole evidence that's allowed in, be it written form or, or oral form, uh, the court isn't going to allow it to actually contradict what the words of the partially um, integrated contract actually say, but it can supplement or clarify terms. Now, if we have one of these fully integrated contracts, and of course the court's going to decide which bucket we're in, then no parole evidence is going to be allowed. So you, this is again where you want to be. This is the sweet spot for you. So now we've talked about the statute of frauds in our previous lecture. Um, the interpretation rules for contracts, and the parole evidence rule. So we have covered all three of our topics. Here are some things to think about as you're considering your drafting. Things that you definitely want to include in a written contract. Obviously, you want to provide the identity of the parties. We gave an example about that. I'll just go back here and show you what we're talking about here. Here we have our parties identified right here. 
oops, sorry. And now we're going to do the subject matter. Um, This may not be, doesn't state it super clearly here, but let's look at this example. So the subject matter is an asset purchase agreement providing for the purchase by JARO of certain assets. So this is the subject. This is an example of how you might provide the, the subject. Then we have the material terms. Let's look at our first example for this. And we have duties, term, and compensation. Here we have the contractor's duty, term of engagement, compensation, and provisions for payment therein shall be set forth in the budget, which is attached in Schedule A. And so this is where we get the duties and the terms and the compensation in this section. The price or consideration, again, it's going to be the compensation right here. A place for signatures. We have a place for signatures right here. Um, we didn't have a merger clause on this one, but we saw other contracts that did have merger clauses. Let's see, where's a merger clause that we had? Here's an example of one you might include. Um, and then this is an example, you might want to include a contract interpretation clause in which you say that both parties participated in the drafting of this contract. As always, if you have any questions about any topic that we covered today, please send me an email. Otherwise, you're welcome to come to my office hours. Sometimes uh, it can be most helpful for us to actually sit down and, and work through whatever questions that you have. I thank you for your attention. I hope that you have a great day. Take care.